I have put in reading assignments on Canvas. You're going to like them because they're mostly newspaper articles. Uh, but some of them are some reports, one that was just written to Congress last a few weeks ago. And so as you start as we start going to these classes, those reports, those links will be on Canvas at the end of, towards the end of the week, if not sooner. And hopefully we'll start putting those on the website also for people who are interested. So today, my great pleasure hi, to uh, welcome one of my best friends, the FF. You're gonna meet a lot of them, by the way. Name's uh, Becky Mitchell. She is the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board. The Colorado Water Conservation Board is the policy making board for the state of Colorado. She is appointed by governor, the governor, to represent Colorado on the Upper Colorado River Compact Commission and on all of the Colorado River negotiations. And in fact, she's been in the middle of negotiations, which is why she couldn't be here today. She's working you in between the states of Arizona and the states of Nevada. So Becky, thank you. Becky is an engineer by trade. Uh, she has a degree from Mines. And uh, with that, Becky, I'm gonna turn it over to you. This is our Colorado River Commissioner. Well, and, and thanks, Jennifer. Um, I would say Jennifer is also a friend and um, really laid the foundation for me to be in the role that I am in now. Um, and really, I see her as a mentor and a leader, um, and the friend is just the bonus part of it. But um, so I, I hope you guys realize how fortunate you are to have her um, in your midst and um, how uh, special she is and how much knowledge she carries. So um, I hope you appreciate the amount of um, or the caliber of educators you have. Um, like Jennifer mentioned, um, I'm not a lawyer. So that's, that's I'm, I'm not a lawyer, she, she um, is, but um, so not trained in that way. I, I did go to uh, Colorado School of Mines. So um, have a bit of that kind of background, um, both my bachelor's and master's. And if you have any questions at any point, um, or if you want my contact info to um, chat at any point about career paths or potential opportunities and, and those sort of things, um, we can always discuss that. But um, I, I do love talking about water. I love talking about the Water Conservation Board. I love talking about um, our rivers. Um, I love talking about how we've progressed in um, Colorado because of people like Jennifer Gimble um, leading. And, um, and on another note also, um, she, Jennifer mentioned um, that I sit as um, the Colorado's representative on the Upper Colorado River Compact Commission, um, but I also do that for the Arkansas River also. So um, we have much to protect in Colorado and uh, the Water Conservation um, Board is at the, at the forefront of that. So I just to give a bit of a background of what I'm gonna talk about, I'll first talk about um, the agency, the makeup, how, you know, how it came about, um, kind of what we do the water plan a little bit, and then I will talk about um, the Colorado River as long as you guys want me to. I'm told to keep it under 40 minutes. I, I'm positive I can do that so I can leave plenty of time for questions. And um, we'll go from there. So um, I, again, like I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start this, sorry, so that I can, um, let me try this one more time um, so I can start the show. Um, and go from there. All right, is everybody seeing it? Perfect, I'm, I'm thinking that's a yes. So first, first of all, again, I've already introduced myself, but a little bit of background on the agency. Um, like Jennifer mentioned, the policy agency of the state. So um, when we talk about like the state engineer's office um, or division of water resources, 
that's actually the more on the regulatory side. Um, I, we're on the policy making side. Um, the board was established in 1937, really with a mission to conserve, develop, protect, and manage Colorado's water for present and future generations. Um, the board is made up of, sorry, I'm struggling trying to advance this slide. Give me one second. Um, once, give me one second, sorry. Becky, I wonder if you go to slideshow, if it'll- Yeah, that's up. what I'm, I'm trying to do. There we go. Okay, we're starting it again. Hopefully that'll do it. Um, yeah, put it on slideshow. There we go. From beginning, there we go. There you go, you got it. Oh, well, um, thank you, <laughs> thanks. It's sometimes hard to do um, do this while you're you're presenting, but we got it, we got it, we can do this. Um, so, fifteen member board, um, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, these nine of those board members are governor appointed representatives from from each basin um, and each river basin. And then um, there's also one uh, representing the Denver Denver metro region. And then um, so that's nine. And then you have six state agency officials, um, including myself. So that makes up the 15 member board. Uh, they're really responsible for three major tasks. Um, uh, identify policy development needs, set program directions, and then define programs and projects priorities, um, all with that mission in mind. You can see that mission, you don't need me to read it to you, but um, really that with that focus on conserving, developing, and protecting um, Colorado's water. Um, then on top of that, we have um, the Interbasin Compact Committee um, that was created under the Water for the 21st Century Act um, at, and that established the Interbasin Compact Committee and then also these basin roundtables. Uh, so separate entities, but they're coordinated through um, the Water Conservation Board. They're technically separate independent in entities. Um, and the Interbasin Compact Committee was created in 2005, um, and it's a 27 member group of water leaders. Um, if, and really the focus is to facilitate conversations between the basins and then address statewide issues. Um, it, it, I, I, um, when I think about the Interbasin Compact Committee, I really think about the important diverse and balanced forum that it is for policy input and solutions across Colorado. Um, the members of that committee are um, really the folks that are on the ground. They've helped shape numerous, numerous planning um, initiatives and really try to pinpoint policy challenges and, and focus on and addressing discourse across the roundtables. This the the group I think I would say is incredibly critical for bringing the ideas and challenges um, and informing our state officials or um, officials like the Water Conservation Board on on policy needs. So um, two members from each of those basin roundtables um, are are um, are on the IBCC and then six of those members of the IBCC are appointed by the governor. And they're typically geographically um, diverse parts of the state, but they also represent different interests. So whether you're an environmentalist, a recreationalist, um, locally focused, um, industrial or agricultural, um, there, there's usually a diversity in um, those six um, governor representatives. And then one member is uh, appointed by the Senate Ag Committee, and then um, one me member is appointed by House Ag. Um, and then that group is led by the director of compact negotiations, um, also appointed by the governor. And right now that happens to be the director of DNR, Dan Gibbs. So, um, it, and that that changes, um, There's we've had um, a, a variety of leaders of that group. Um, and, but right now that is, that is Dan Gibbs and he and I, 
that's my boss um, in in one of my jobs. So um, we work very well together, and I think it it it's a complementary uh, setup. So a little bit of a picture of the round tables. You can see the river basins, um, South Platte, Arkansas, Rio Grande, San Juan, Dolores, Gunnison, Colorado, Yampa, and the North Platte. Those are the eight river basins and then the metro basin that I, that I talked about, which is not technically a river basin, but um, it it's, uh, has its own round table representation. Um, each of those round tables actually have a, um, uh, a education liaison that serves um, on the public education and participation out outreach work group. Um, and the goal of that committee is similar to the IBCC, um, come together um, and discuss policy issues and really bring educational challenges um, to the forefront uh, for discussion and collaboration of ideas. Um, the water education, I think it's, it's such an interesting um, kind of topic. It, it's really come to, uh, it, it's really risen as something that has to happen. Um, when we talk about the sheer amount of money that's going to need to be involved to, to finding long-term solutions, um, not only in the critical Colorado River Basin, but across the state, um, it, I think it's so important that education is broad. We reach multiple, um, it, we reach out in multiple different venues wherever we can. And so um, as, as you can see, water is getting national attention at this point. Um, and so it, the, the education component and making sure that there isn't misinformation out there is, is gonna be critical to how we move forward as a state. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the water plan and, um, and some of where that's come from and um, how it's evolved. Um, in May of 2013, then Governor Hickenlooper signed an executive order that created our state's first official water plan. Um, I wanna be completely transparent when it comes to that. I think it's important to recognize it. it wasn't like um, we had just sat around and not done anything uh, um, to that point. Um, it, it was just happening differently. And, and um, where it seemed like the additional steps were needed was really on that implementation and how could we get um, more assistance on um, the public level, on the, uh, from our legislators, from leadership. And so I think, um, I, I think that's a lot of where the creation of the water plan came from. Uh, it really started as a grassroots um, <clears throat> effort between the nine basin roundtables and the Water Conservation Board. And I think that would be what <clears throat> I would be, I would consider the success of, of the water plan was that it started grassroots um, and um, it's, it's maintained um, a lot of that grassroots sense where it's um, folks on the ground determining what they want their future to look like. Um, so the first plan, it came out of executive order in 2013. The, um, the first plan was published in 2015 and it continues to be one of the biggest statewide endeavors um, that, that we've worked on um, in the state, but it definitely is one of the biggest endeavors at the Water Conservation Board. It, it really tries to bring together all sectors that use water in their everyday practices and operations and provide that roadmap to creating solutions for our water challenges um, and, and really look to creating the future that we want to be, our water future that we wanna be in Colorado. And so when we talk about that roadmap, we think about things that I call them the irrefutable truths. Um, and, and that's that um, being perfectly honest, um, that, that, that creates something that I, I think it's hard for folks to disagree with some of the, the overarching goals, a productive economy, vibrant and sustainable cities, viable and productive agriculture, strong and healthy environment, robust recreation and tourism industries. All of those I think 
everyone can agree with, but it's how do we make it work together? And I think that's, um, so I do think those are the irrefutable truths that, the, that um, we aim for, but how do we do that in a way that um, we move them all together um, and uh, in an appropriate way, especially when we are looking at the, what we're dealing with climate change and um, dwindling supplies and growth and um, a lot of um, what's been highlighted through COVID with supply chain issues and things like that. So um, along with the water plan, we have what I call the heart of, of the water plan, which is the basin implementation plans. Those are developed by those round tables. Um, and uh, to this day, they continue to inform the process of how we implement the water plan on a regional and local level. So since 2015, I can tell you our staff worked um, with water stakeholders and other partners across the state to, to look at how that framework supported water management and use um, whatever new um, data we've got and new tools that are available. So um, I think that's, um, that's something when new data is present, you should be using that. I think that's, um, and we need to always strive to be getting new and um, better data. And, and I think that is why we don't have just one water plan and it's done. We have to continue to, to push the envelope, but we also have to continue to have these metrics that, that say, are we doing what we, what um, are we moving in the direction that we've said we're gonna move to? So. Um, another um, important component of the water plan is scenario planning. Um, you see those right in front of you. Um, and as, as some example, um, and really looking at scenario planning for the future, that's really focusing on using the state of the art tools and data and incorporate models that account for changes and uncertainties related to economy increased drought, new technologies, and, and, and more. So when, when um, we'd be surprised, these are all so interwoven. It's not just about the water that's available or a water supply that's available um, or what exactly the needs are, but there are implications for social values or um, climate status, um, agricultural needs. It's, it's important to remember that it all kind of interplays um, and there's many different lever levers. So um, this is, um, again, when I talked about metrics and holding ourselves accountable, we talked about goals. Um, and I, I'm not going to read all of these, but these are some of um, some of the um, original um, goals, and um, and they're the pretty much the larger objectives um, of the water plan by category. Um, how do we how do we achieve those? Um, what is the state's role in that? Um, again, you heard Jennifer, and then you heard me echo, we're the policy making agency, we're not a regulatory agency. So um, I'm hoping she's teaching you about the carrot versus the stick. And um, we really have much more carrot than we have of stick, um, because of the way this the structure of the agency is. And so um, we look at ways that we can move the state forward. And the way that we can do that is the carrot. And so we provide grants um, and, um, and have created a new grant program because of the water plan. You might've heard of referendum um, DD, which is um, uh, the, the gambling monies going towards um, uh, water and or water projects. And um, some of that money is going to um, things that fit into these um, buckets. So we typically like to work on projects and focus on projects that are what we call multi-beneficial. So they're not just an agricultural project or a conservation project or an environmental project or a water supply and storage project. We really try to look at projects that are helping local communities um, in more ways than just one. And so they can be awarded in different groups. And, and so um, a, a great example of that is the Dem Denver Water or, or One Water Plan um, project. It's by the Greenway Foundation where we, we know um, the cities specifically across the Front Range, but now with COVID <laughs> that, that sprawl has happened on the Western Slope also. Um, 
that um, they continue to experience population growth, but um, but still have limited land use policies for guiding water decisions. That's been highlighted as one of the issues that interconnection between land use and um, and water use and and making sure that um, we're working together on those. And so those are the types of projects that um, we look at. And, um, and if I could interrupt you just a minute, always. <laughs> You're Jennifer Gimble. You can interrupt me anytime you want. Um, I, I would also mention that the water center gets yes. substantial amounts of money every year from CWCB. I'd uh, love to talk programs. about that too. And, and thanks for bringing that up. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons why this class is so exciting and to hear you guys working with Fort Lewis and the collaboration and that it's, it's, you know, CSU and Fort Lewis and it's the education across the board. We're always looking for ways um, that uh, to do projects that really push the envelope or push the research that we need. And so that collaboration with the Colorado Water Center is one of what I think is the best because we we talk about projects and getting things done, whether that's research that people aren't doing and we're looking to the universities and we're really looking at ways to build our future and pull people into water, whether they like it kicking and screaming um, or not, but um, really make sure that folks recognize there is research and work that needs to be done. And we want it to go to our um, state institutions and, and really get folks that we see as the future of water working on these things early on. So oftentimes we'll sit down, I think, that time just passed, am I right? Where- Yeah, where, well, it'll come up again this spring. Yeah, where we start talking about, okay, here are some of the things that we need and and do you have um, undergrad students that could work on this? Do you have master students that can work on this? Do you have PhD students that can work on this? And those, those projects have implemented real change on the ground. And so in terms of um, a great collaboration, that would be one that I say is one of the most important. So thanks, thanks, Becky. I'm going to take a break and see if there are any questions. You covered a lot of ground. CWCB, basin round tables, water plan. Any questions for Becky? And if you guys don't give me questions, um, Jennifer will give you a demerit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions here and I'm not hearing from Fort Lewis. So go ahead, Becky. Okay, and, and I'm sure we'll, um, we get to talk about the Colorado River too, so I'm sure there'll be tons of questions there, and if there's not, I'm gonna, everybody gets a C for the day, not an A, so, um, but uh, I, 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 the questions are my favorite part, so, um, again, um, talking about um, our pr uh, process and, um, and, where we're at and um, how much success we've had. I think, again, one of the most important things that I think, this is my personal opinion, that government has to do is hold, you know, create structures um, that um, measure success and failures. Like there is learning and failure also, right? And so um, we, we, we do that through that grant program, but we also um, look at the progress that we've made on multiple goals. And so um, when we talk about how far we've come, um, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary in 2020. Um, and so we did kind of a look at that 2020 mark. Um, and in just five years, we made progress on 76% of the stated actions within those the, the plan. Um, that was almost 300 like individual actions. Like I showed you the, the larger goals, but we had about 300 individual actions and something had been done and progress had, had been made on 76% of those. Um, I, I, get to, um, I get to say a little bit, um, more on that. I, I think it's important when I say progress that um, the, the kudos for that needs to be distributed. We are, again, the policy agency. We're not building water projects on the ground. We're not, um, we, we do a lot of amazing work. We work on the ground, but ultimately um, it takes all of us to, to make that progress. And so that 76% progress rate in, in um, 
on those actions is because of the community of water users and um, and stakeholders that have said this is important to us. And so this is some of how it's been highlighted. Um, and then again, um, in January of 2022, each of the basin roundtables released an updated basin implementation plan. And it's important to recognize that those basin implementation plans, these are these are folks that are volunteers. They're creating these reports. Um, uh, oftentimes, um, in their own, on their own time, on their own dollar, um, they're they're sitting in meetings. Um, this is the community coming together. They do often have um, a consultant that's do, uh, that's pulling it together. But people are still um, really putting a lot of their own time into it. And um, so we've got updated based on um, uh, implementation plans, which are um, tailored for each of the basins, and they're incorporated. Um, they incorporated that new data and tools that were available. And then those, again, are incorporated into the larger um, water plan. And so we've had about a year of initial public and stakeholder feedback that, that we've gathered. Um, and again, I think when we talk about future and the policy and, and um, I, I think it's important to recognize that how you get impact, uh, uh, input and how you address it um, is going to be critical to success. I, um, when you think about it, the future and the work that you do, whatever that is in whatever realm, if there is a need for public input, how you get that um, is, is going to be critical, but then what you do with it um, is even more critical. Uh, and, and I can't stress that enough. Um, so, Kind of um, our our focus areas. Um, we've we've identified um, the the four focus areas: the vibrant communities, robust agriculture, thriving watersheds, and resilient planning. In the face of climate change, that that resilient water planning is is critical. Um, so every goal and project that enhances Colorado's water future can can fit into one of those focus areas. So that's. That is um, definitely where we're at, and we're we're at the point right now where um, we've we've been taking a significant amount of public input, and we're we're in, um, incorporating that into the the final uh, water plan 2023. And um, sorry, I I said that before I skipped the slide. Um, do anybody have any questions on the agency or the water plan and or I can go right into kind of what's happening on the Colorado River Basin. I think Becky we're anxious to hear about the Colorado River and what you have to say. Everybody is that's all they want to talk about. <laughs> so, um, and so. Uh, I get to put on a different hat right now. So the first hat I had on was the, the CWCB director. And so now you get to hear um, the hat as um, the Colorado River Commissioner. And so that's the other role. And so I use the board as a, um, as a bit of a, an advisory in this role, but um, as the, the state's commissioner, um, to the Colorado River Basin. This this is the appointed part where um, where I work um, directly with the governor's office and um, and the governor's initiatives. Um, but that doesn't mean that 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 goes without input from uh, pretty much every water user in in the state. So um, this this um, this role really is where I work with the Upper Colorado River commissioners, um, the other commissioners. So there's a commissioner in New Mexico, um, Esteban Lopez, um, a commissioner in Wyoming, Brandon Gebhardt, and then a commissioner in Utah, Jean Shawcroft. Um, and so we work together to negotiate water use in the basin. Um, and then again, the operations for Lakes Powell and me between all the seven basin states. And so um, that would uh, include Arizona, Nevada, and California. And so a little bit of background. In 2019, the Upper Colorado River Basin states agreed on a drought contingency plan. 
uh, and that was really focused on sharing Colorado River water in the face of prolonged drought and climate change. Um, I think it was a step in the right direction um, and for, for properly managing Colorado River resources across the region. Um, and that drought contingency plan included both upper basin and lower basin plans. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, what, what's happened in the upper basin um, and what has or has not happened in the lower basin. So in the upper basin, um, part of the drought contingency plan was um, the investigation of a potential demand management program. And that is a concept of a temporary, voluntary, and compensated reduction of consumptive use of water in the Upper Colorado River um, Basin. So the four upper basin states. That conserved water would then um, be used only for maintain, maintaining water levels at Lake Powell for compact compliance or ensuring um, water needs in the lower basin. So that was one part of the drought contingency plan. Um, it wasn't a foregone conclusion. It didn't say we must do demand management. It basically just said we must investigate it and, and see how this would work. Um, and then what really has come out of that investigation is that there are so many questions that um, would need to be answered and steps that would need to be taken before we could do a demand management program um, or before that could be set up. And then another component of that is that all four upper basin states, so Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico all have to agree on key elements of um, such a program before we can move forward. So it's um, and just a reminder, it's only one idea of uh, conserving water in the Colorado River Basin. I think there, there are some others for sure, um, and, but it is, it, it is an option and it, it um, could be a potential helpful option. Um, then I, I want to kind of shift a little bit to probably some of the news that you've heard um, of recently, because if it's almost every day, if not multiple times every day, that uh, the Colorado River is is in the paper, and there's a reason for that, or in the internet, I guess hardly any papers come out anymore, but um, but there's a reason for that. There's 40 million people that rely on the Colorado River, uh, over 40 million people, uh, seven states, two countries that rely on um, uh, the, the, the Colorado River. And so um, when we see the situation that we're in with reservoir levels dropping um, and um, the, the demand far outweighing the supply, um, we're, we're going to have a problem, and um, that problem is is obvious. And um, when you see reservoir levels dropping, and you see pictures, and um, you hear about communities that um, are getting close to not having a water supply, um, that is definitely going to hit the news. And so you probably, um, if you are interested in water at all, you probably know that in June um, of this last summer. Um, just a few months ago, the Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner, Camille Tootin, um, called on all seven basin states and said, um, we need to conserve an additional two to four million acre feet following um, some of the, the drops that they're seeing in, in Lake Powell. Um, and so um, you remember the drought contingency plan that was signed. Um, we, we had been following everything that we needed to do with that. That included some cloud seeding, investigation of demand management. Um, but there was that call to action by Commissioner Tootin. And so the upper basin states, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Wyoming responded. And we said, um, let, let's talk about the numbers a little bit. First and foremost, the, the compact essentially um, split, split a river and, um, and we, um, in 2021, preliminary numbers showed um, in those upper basin states used three and a half million acre feet. Um, the lower basin states used, um, in, and Mexico used about 10 million acre feet. Um, there's only so much we can do, but we're willing to be a part of the solution. So um, we responded with a five point plan. It included 
five measures that our state can take um, to support um, this call to action. Um, further um, investigating demand management, reinitiating of a system conservation pilot program. Um, we're we're um, going to continue with uh, um, the uh, active conservation that um, that we are known for in the upper basin. I think a lot of what you're hearing about some of the communities doing um, in California, those are our standard operations practices. We always have watering days. We always, we always are um, focused that way. So, um, and, and then we also talked about getting measurement and monitoring um, in place as quickly as possible and using any federal funds and getting that money on the ground. So um, we responded um, and, um, and, and I feel like are taking active um, measures uh, to, to move forward. You probably heard criticism about there weren't specific numbers with that. So much of the what um, what we do in the upper basin is dependent on hydrology. So we don't have a reservoir above us where we say, oh, this year we're going to use this much and grow this exactly and this is how much water it needs. We really uh, snowpack is our storage and um, in much of in many cases and so we um, we don't have the same kind of certainty and so our our actions are limited by um, the uncertainty of of um, mother nature and she ha she has um, definitely been calling us um, all to to do more and so um, our our response is limited though due to that um, so that being said, though, there is um, definitely recognition um, on the from the federal level of Western water issues and support um, through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Federal Infrastructure Bill. And so some of that money will be going to the work that we've committed to doing um, in the Upper Basin. And um, all at the same time, though, um, and and Jennifer can talk about this. She's as knowledgeable as any of us on on the history of the Colorado River. But we're renegotiating the guidelines at the same time. We're we're going into this renegotiation period of where we look at the um, relook at the operations of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. So right now we're dealing with not only a crisis, but um, how do we deal with um, the future at the same time? And so. The guidelines for how those um, reservoirs like Powell and Lake Mead uh, will operate, those expire in 2026 and may seem far away, but um, if you've uh, worked um, with seven states and two countries, um, it, it will pass in a blink of an eye. Um, and so we're already preparing on uh, for what kind of changes we need to see based on um, living within that supply and demand. Um, and especially as we see these drought um, conditions worsen. We're also, um, one of the most important things um, that I uh, have been focused on and I think uh, is incredibly important is that um, we're striving to include some underrepresented groups um, including our tribal nations uh, more than ever before. That's that's one of my main priorities. And so how do we do that? Uh, that might have been an easier task to do at a time of plenty, but I think it's an even more important task as um, when we think about times of um, that we're in right now, which is not times of plenty. Um, and so I am I'm gonna pause for a bit and see if you guys have questions. If not, I know Jennifer Gimble will be asking me yeah. questions. <laughs> Thanks, I, I just uh, came up to the podium um, and I keep- I, Yeah, I see I keep Caitlin- not, buttons too much here. I, uh, in any I case, Caitlin, uh, Becky. Caitlin is asking a question over there in Fort oh. Lewis, I think. Okay, great. Go for it. Hi. Um, so I'm actually pretty new to the water world. My background's in wildlife conservation myself. So been really fascinating hearing all this information. I was looking through the website that was linked um, via the QR code right there and uh -huh. saw that um, in there it lists that 
Um, the upper basin is used 25% or in 2021, the upper basin used 25% less water than they did in 2020, dropping it down about a million acre feet. It seems yeah. like quite a huge and dramatic reduction in water use in a single year. Do you have any intuition on what caused that? Was that some sort of strange like effect of COVID or something? And no. do you expect that decrease to persist? I, I do know what caused that. And um, and so I would love to say that we were, were so actively conserving and this is what we did. Um, it, that is because of the situation um, and where where Fort Lewis sits probably took so much of that hit um, in that southwest corner of the state. Um, they, they've been hit the hardest in the last few years. And so um, when I talked about not having a reservoir above us um, to, to really provide um, the security that you see um, um, or consistency that you, you might see if you were in a lower basin state, that is purely because the water was not available. And so um, that reduction happened because it wasn't available. And so people had to make tough decisions. Um, an example of that is on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation, they have about 110 center pivots. Agriculture is a, a, a a part of their livelihood, a part of the way that um, they maintain their economy. Of their 110 pivots, um, only 10 were in operation. Um, so that is um, a direct hit on, on uh, people on the ground. Um, and I think that's important to recognize. It's also important to recognize that when, um, when, when Mother Nature determines it's not our year, um, and as she has so frequently, um, there's not been a financial safety net uh, that that you see when we're asking for voluntary conservation. Um, it, it's it it is um, just a uh, impact that hits the community. It and it hits broader than just on the farm. It hits the entire community. So when when one farmer suffers, um, when one area suffers, it the the trickle effect of that is great. And so yes, that was a cut. We are proud of it. But it's because um, of the way that. Um, the regulatory side of the state works where we administer water and um, and we follow the prior appropriation system. So that reduction was coming largely from a lack of water available in the first place. I imagine that means that if we have more water in, in subsequent years, you'll expect use to go back up from that baseline. And um, in that you, in that reduction, did you did we see a reduction of water use at the household level that matched that twenty five percent reduction? or was it largely from lack of availability for irrigation or um, agriculture? So uh, much of um, the um, cities are in an active conservation mode. Um, specifically, if you look on the front range, they're always um, operating in active conservation at this point. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see uh, percentages up to 30% for cities like Aurora over a certain period of time of reduction. Um, I think Denver's at the 23% range. Um, all of the communities are, are limiting outdoor water use, timing of water. Um, there's, um, we have our water fixture legislation that you can only buy water smart um, fixtures within Colorado. There's many things that are, that maybe not seen to the naked eye, um, but are, are different than in other areas of the country. I think it's important to note, if I can hop in here, Becky, that Denver, for example, 50% of their water supply is from the Colorado River. Uh, same on the Arkansas, a whole lot of water goes over there. And so here in Northern Colorado, we have a lot of water that comes from the Colorado River. So these communities see it coming. The other comment I would make is there's a small community called Dove Creek of a thousand people in Southwest uh, Colorado that were five days away from losing their complete water supply because of the uh, hydrology that Becky was talking about. Um, there was somebody, Kara was online and had a question. Do you want to ask your question, Kara? 
Oh, that's great. Hey, Becky, thanks so much. I'm a political scientist out here on the Western Slope of Colorado. And I am super curious because you're kind of the political guru in the world of water. Um, <laughs> can you talk to us a little bit about um, how you work with both Democrats and Republicans in the state, but also across states? Um, well, I think one of the things that's beneficial about water is that it crosses political lines. Um, I think folks, when we going back a little bit to the water plan and we talked about environment, um, viable um, local communities and economies, that that's that is across political lines. And, and so I think everyone can recognize the impacts that having a safe, secure uh, water supply um, or not having that can, can cause. And so uh, I, we try to be as apolitical as possible. Um, I learned that from my dear mentor, Jennifer Gamble. Um, and because this isn't a Republican Democrat issue um, as much as it is a Colorado issue, a Western states issue. And so we're all gonna figure, have to figure out how to get to the solution, regardless of what political party you are. The path may look a little different um, and there may be concerns on the financial side. It, it is really trying to figure out how do we do this in a way that brings everybody because there's no way we can do this without everyone. And so, um, that has been a primary focus of, of mine, um, specifically, um, first and foremost, bringing Colorado together. And I think we've, we've seen that. Um, and then, and then really bringing everyone together for the greater good of the basin. Um, I think Fort Lewis has got another question. Yay. Yeah, I really appreciate that last question. I find the political side of this really interesting as well. Um, so, you know, assuming we can sell the public on this idea that this is not a political issue, that it's not partisan at all. How do we also communicate the importance of conserving water in Colorado to help out communities that are downstream from us? If we have places like Dove Creek that are already getting close to running out of water, what is the narrative for convincing Coloradans who have kind of the luxury of being first at a lot of this water to um, make cuts and changes to their lifestyles? so that people in different states and different countries can benefit? Well, and I think um, I, these last few years, I would say we are not the lucky ones, um, to be perfectly honest, because we don't have it, right? It's not there. Um, and we don't have, a, again, don't have the reservoir above us. That doesn't mean that we don't um, still push it. And so it goes back to that water plan piece where we talk about water education and and really pushing forward as many initiatives as we can and it is it is saving at your own tap but it's how do we look at um, efficiencies across the board and really focusing on a lot of that message is living within the means right and being responsive to what mother nature is providing and um and when you hear me talk about new data new tools um and that when we look at the federal dollars being spent on monitoring and measurement devices the reason that needs to happen is because we need to be able to respond quickly and make changes and provide flexibility in our system right away when we see something coming. Um, we've gotten almost, I don't wanna say too good at that um, because when we look at um, our watersheds being ravaged by fire and and, um, and the changes that those, that happens um, right away when we, when we see that, um, we're, we, we need to do this like urgent, and long-term plan at the same time. How do we how do we handle this immediately? What is Mother Nature providing? But also say, how do we live within what Mother Nature provides, but also prepare for different um, different events? So, Becky, what about the five hundred million dollars that we read about this week going to the Upper Basin? What do you see that going to? 
So um, I, I think you you probably heard some vagueness in the language on that, and and there's some reasoning why. I think um, they're really looking to the upper basin states to say, hey, what do you think? Um, I think there's options there. We have the system conservation pilot program and the extension of that. That is a voluntary, um, temporary, and compensated conservation. And so there'll be some money that goes to that. Um, I, I think there's um, already an effort um, and identification of locations for measurement and monitoring devices. Um, and so we're, we're going to try to get that on the ground right away. There's also kind of community ideas of um, ways that environment and ag and um, recreation can work together and maybe put some money towards things like that um, and, and look at ways to conserve uh, both on the short term and on a permanent basis. Now, when you talk about the big dollars um, that have been put towards the situation that we are in, 500 million um, is, a, is a, a smaller percentage. Um, and I think what that means to me, um, while some may be extremely negative about that, um, I, I believe what it shows to me um, is that um, where the use is, is um, heavily needs to be fixed um, and where that use is out of balance um, with, with the supply is in the lower basin states of California and Arizona, specifically below Lake Mead. Um, and so that's, that's where a lot of the money is going because there needs to be permanent solutions, changes there. Um, I am not saying flood irrigation is good, but when you flood irrigate in the upper basin on the Colorado River system, that goes back to the system. If you flood irrigate in the in in um, areas in the lower basin, that is gone from the system. There is no recharge of the system at that point. Um, and flood irrigation is still happening. Um, and so there, there needs to be big changes. And I think that's why you saw the majority, the big dollars going um, there because the permanent solutions, um, the flexibility, that's, that is a, where so much needs to happen. And that was a total of $4 billion, right? Yes. For the Colorado River and other and adjacent rivers basement. Drop. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Think, Hold on. on. How has it evolved that the lower basin states have so exceeded their seven and a half million acre feet? So Becky, how has it evolved that the lower basin states have so exceeded their 7.5 million acre feet allowance? Well, Jennifer can probably talk about that far um, it, more gracefully than I can, or um, Jennifer Gimble, your um, leader in charge, can probably talk about that far more gracefully than I can. But I think it's important to recognize there is not a breaking of the law. Um, and in, in terms of their use. We had um, shortage protocols. We also have um, overage protocols and they've been able um, to um, really work within the structures um, to use water um, that when we, we had times of plenty that were sitting in the reservoirs. I think um, we've learned a lot from how quickly that can shift and we'll be definitely thinking about that as we go into the, the renegotiations. My um, issue when I talk about how much is used in the lower basin, the issue is not so much that they put it to use when it's there, um, because I think um, there, there is a, a benefit to the American people if we're producing um, good healthy food and, and that sort of thing. Um, my issue is not that we put it to use when it's available, it's that um, the reliance that has occurred because it was available um, and now it's not. And so that reliance piece is where the problem is and that expectation of that it will always be there. And so, um, and somewhat of that entitlement. That, that for me is um, the issue. And so it is um, weaning um, and it, it is uh, gonna need to be a quick wean um, at, because there's no other way and it, sh and it should have been happening. And so when we talk about this crisis at hand, um, we, uh, I, I, I have been explaining it. If any of you are in math or sciences, or I, it's a simple mass balance. You have this. This last year is an example. 
6.3 million acre feet going into PAL and 7 million going out, the reservoir is going to drop. It is a very simple mass balance equation. Um, and uh, But the, the reliance and expectation of um, having more than what mother nature provides is, is what the issue is. The other piece of it too is that the lower basin is not charged for the consumptive use of evaporation and transport losses, mm -hmm. which is about 1.2 million acre feet a year. And so that just exacerbated its dependence on water coming out of need. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed that you really didn't mention climate change at all. Um, and I was wondering if that's part of trying to be a bipartisan uh, organization or, and then in general, like how do you act as bipartisan or act as politically neutral when climate change is an important issue? Great question. So Becky, climate change is a big issue. You've uh, not talked much about it, and is it talked much on the river to, due to the bipartisan aspect of negotiations on the river? Uh, I think all you have to do <laughs> is look at the river to believe in climate change. Um, I think uh, naysayers are um, definitely uh, recognizing that um, they may not call it out always specifically as climate change, but um, but living within lower hydrology or whatever you want to call it um, is fine with me, but we don't have as much water as we used to. Um, I, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat or how you say it, but um, it's not there. Therefore, we're going to have to figure out how to, to deal with it. One of the lessons I think we've learned over the last 20 years is that all of our models on how the future is going to be was dependent on what the past was. Mm -hmm. the different iterations and we found out that that doesn't work in in the face of climate change that you cannot predict the future just looking at the past and so that's where the scenario planning gets into and that's why becky in the water plan talked about scenarios different scenarios it's a great question any other questions none here any in uh, at fort lewis Go ahead. i've got one more if no one else is jumping into there um well, first, I'd just say coming from a wildlife side, one thing we talk about sometimes in the climate change narrative is that, um, yeah, models of the past are hard to rely on sometimes. Using data from the past is um, all we have, but can be troubling. But one thing we're seeing is that there's a lot more downside risk than upside risk. But there's a lot of unknown ways that we can be wrong for the worse and very, very few things ways we can be wrong for the better. Um, and I imagine that's probably at play with water too. So it's, you know, you always have to assume that these models are only worse than what we think. But then um, secondly, I was wondering if you could follow up on the question in the chat from August. Essentially, um, I'm curious as well, with that 25% reduction between 2020 and 2021, did that water use in 2020, which I understand is dictated by a lack of availability, was that a sustainable amount of use from a social and economic point of view? Like, is that kind of proof that we could just be operating with 25% less water all the time? Or was that a thing that we kind of barely eked out for a year, but couldn't do every year? Um, I think what, what I saw on the ground and when I specifically talked, um, and thank you for the first depressing comment about most of the data um, is in the negative, not the positive. Um, yep. <laughs> I don't have anything to say to that, except that you're probably right. And that just makes me more depressed, but that's okay. Um, but, um, but in terms of I, I, I think it was a bit of an eking by. Um, and I, I think that was in response to what was available. It was in response to um, strict administration um, of, of what was available. But what I saw on the ground were herds, um, uh, people's livestock being sold off, um, people making hard decisions of whether how how much longer they could do this um, community suffering um, I talked specifically about the Ute Mountain Ute because um, 
when you talk about getting 10% of what is a, um, what it is at, you're allocated, um, that there that does not come without pain, and there's nothing equitable about that. Um, and at the same time, when the releases from Lake Powell and Lake Mead remain unchanged, and so that that is that is where um, the joint suffering. Um, is something that was somewhat lacking. Um, and I think that's that's where we can lose whole communities. If if um, if if there are folks that are able to benefit while we are suffering, I think that that is that's a real tipping point that I think um, it is is something that we have to evaluate of how how do we want to to move forward that I don't think it's a, a sustainable. I don't think um, that um, we won't lose some of um, what we consider Colorado um, or the upper basin if we maintain that for years and years. Um, and I, if you ask people in specifically the Southwest corner of the state, could they do that for five more years and still be in business? And I think much of them would say no. And what does that mean? Um, and what does that look like? Can we do better? Always. But um, what is the tipping point? Another question here. Will the compact have to be renegotiated? If so, how will that come about? Will the compact have to be renegotiated and how will that come about? I, I think it's important to remember the foundational elements of the compact and, and what we touched on. Um, if uh, I, I'm gonna say this, if you think we would do any better now, um, I think you're, you're wrong. Um, if you think, um, when we talked about the political pieces, I mean, there were multiple questions about politics and, and policy and um, politicians. Um, I, I think, I, I often think about our forefathers in 1922, um, and, um, wonder if we've become more graceful, um, than them. I, uh, or, um, I, 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 I don't know if I would want to bet on that. And so I think we really have to focus on the foundational elements of the compact and figure out how we work within that. Um, a perfect example is the tribes were not included in the compact, but we have a responsibility to do better with that. And so we will and must do better. Do I think if we re renegotiated, how, what would it look like? I, I cannot predict um, what a renegotiation would look like, but I wouldn't bet on it being better. Thanks. Well, I think we don't have any more questions here. Fort Lewis, are you good? Not hearing any. Becky, thank you so much. We're going to give you a round of applause. No, thank you guys. And, um, and Jennifer knows how to get in touch with me. So um, if you guys have questions after questions, um, she's probably um, she probably has an opinion and answer for most of them, but um, if you need any input, advice, anything, um, I, I always love to hear it. Thank you so much, Becky. Thank I get to sign off now, right? You get to sign off. <laughs> Thanks so much. I really appreciate all the insight. Thank you. Bye-bye.